Hopefully we would do one one day of this, but um, maybe we'll do a couple. And I think what we'll do is well, uh, someone had suggested fear and anxiety for a Bible study. Um, and what we'll do today then is sort of uh, lay out the framework for it um, and even give the remedy that the Lord provides. And then maybe in part two, we could talk about really, really practical things to do, because I don't think this is something that um, is dependent upon age or location or occupation. I think it's something that most people suffer from, and we'll see we're kind of conditioned for it, actually. I would argue that we live in society that promotes anxiety um, and fear uh, in, in a great many things. But let's pray. Blessed Lord, you provide for us in all things, that you give to us a peace that surpasses all understanding, not a superficial peace, not something that is tossed to and from with the waves of this life and this world. But you relieve our worries and our fears and our, and our anxieties because you are the God of our salvation. But in your Son, Jesus Christ, bore all of our sins and fears and worries, that they were taken to the cross and crucified with him, so that we, in our baptism, raised to new life, we are free from sin and every evil, because Jesus Christ, we share a life with him. In his name we pray, amen. So Paul writes, and this is what will make the basis of what we'll talk about today on in in Philippians chapter 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So you think we, we live the problems of the modern world. I mean, worry is not something or anxiety is not something that is, um, you know, unique to us. But we're kind of in a world where we're conditioned to be anxious about everything. Um, in fact, it probably probably our society in a broader sense demands uh, in a much greater scale than ever before in history that we are. Um, that we worry as a result of all the things that we encounter. So if we were to backtrack 800 years ago, <clears throat> most people in Europe, our ancestors would not have to worry about anything more than local matters. And don't get me wrong, those local matters could be really severe, right? Uh, medical problems, families lost uh, or children lost or life being harsh and brutal and short. So you don't want to make light of that. It's not as if they were, you know, living in some kind of pristine, wonderful world uh, in the medieval period. And in fact, uh, you know, most communications in other parts of the world were really difficult and late. So, and they would be really extreme. So maybe you knew about the Crusades. Maybe you knew about them really closely when your Lord came to you and said, you're now in the crusading army, you're going to go fight. I mean, that's really personal there. But, uh, you know, most people gave little thought to what was occurring in the next county, let alone the next country or the next continent, right? Um, and so apart from really extraordinary events, they weren't in a world that had called upon them to worry about everything else that's happening. So if you want to put it in a simple way, we, we live in a global village now, and it makes you worry. It, it gets you used to worry and anxiety. I mean, the fact that we have information and it's very fast, 
in that we have it in our hands, then uh, those things cause anxiety um, because they demand us to be worried about peace and economics and famine and cultural decline and civil conflict, things you wouldn't normally know about. You can even hear it on the radio. I mean, you think about one time we were at that um, resell shop down in Effingham and the radio you know, news came on and it was four people murdered in Ohio or something like that. And you think, you know, I don't know if I need to know that. And, and what does that actually produce? I mean, it produces something in you, whether you know it or not. And I would argue now you be, we've become desensitized to it. We'll talk about that. But um, our own personal problems and cultural problems are then constantly polluted because they're always being paraded in the, into the media and you're actually being told, maybe not directly, but you're being conditioned to live in a life that is one of worry and anxiety and fear. And you couple all that stuff with just regular life, car troubles and conflict and uh, expectations and you know family problems and marriage and, and children and grief and financial security. You put all of those things together and what happens is you get desensitized. So just like you would get desensitized to violence, if you watch violent TV shows all the time, or you get desensitized to um, sex, if you if you are encountering sexual things all the time, they're always before your eyes, you get desensitized to fear and worry. So, you know, it's a desensitization is a psychological thing that people use uh, to help someone get over the exposure that they're doing. It's not always bad, but it diminishes your emotional response. So you think about if it's something negative or adversive or even positive things, you get um, numb to it is a good way to say. So if you're constantly being bombarded by things that cause anxiety, um, and a lot of that happens on, on your cell phone or on television, and then eventually you become sort of uh, used to them. And I, I would argue it becomes a hardened heart because you become used to being fearful and anxious all the time or worried about things. It becomes normalized, it becomes part of who you are. And uh, Paul there, uh, as we get to the bottom in Hebrews 3, he says, take care, brothers. When he says brothers, he doesn't mean just men. He just means everyone who is a Christian. Lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And so, I mean, hardened to the deceitfulness of sin would be being desensitized to worry and fear that it just becomes a normal part of your life. Maybe sometimes you don't even realize it. So you think is fear and worry and anxiety, is it, is it a sin? And the simple answer is, yeah. I mean, we'll talk about there are some differences that Scripture makes, but yeah, when it's a lack of trust in God above all things, it is. And, and the, the first commandment really lays this out for us in the small catechism. You shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. So anxiety and worry are distress, distress responses to circumstances of life in a fallen world. And in many cases, you know, all of those things are simply the result of uh, sinful fear driven by unbelief and a desire to control the outcomes of life. So scripture distinguishes, it does, between sinfully acting on anxiety and taking and the other the non sinful thing would be taking burdens of our souls to God in prayer. And we'll talk more about prayer the next time we, we talk. We'll talk about very practical applications of that. Um, but, you know, it's not to say you should have a right concern on what concerns God um, and a proper sense of the burdens of life. So uh, it's not to say, well, uh, I don't want to be sinful and anxiety, so I'll just pretend that everything is fine. That's not what's what the, the problem is. That creates another problem. 
And it's not as if you shouldn't be concerned with what God is concerned with, sin and wickedness and evil and, and conquering that, um, and even keeping your life from that. Um, uh, but, you know, our, our knowledge of God, and, and knowledge is not head things, it's a union with God, it's being in, united in communion with him. And the belief in his promises constitute either a, a cause or cure for our sinful anxiety. Um, so it's sinful when you think about doubting God's love and wisdom and protection and creating fear and anxiety from that. And the results are um, sinful actions. I mean, sinful heart things give birth, desires give birth to actions. And those are attempts to, to take matters of life into your own hands um, and not to trust that God is actually doing something and working in something. He actually has your best interest in what's going on. So um, a good way to a good place to start with that is with all things when you got regarding sin is Genesis chapter three. And it says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise because she feared or had anxiety about the wisdom that she currently had. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And their eyes were both opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and uh, made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees. They were then anxious and worried and fearful about God, not in the good sense, but that he was coming to do wicked things because they had done wicked things. So you think Adam, in Adam, brought all of the sin and misery into this world when he disobeyed God by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And his disobedience at the heart of it was an act of distrust. God said, don't eat this. I'll give you these things. I've taken care of you in the garden. And he didn't trust that word um, that he had provided, and it caused a disobedience in him. And so the repercussions are, we've all fallen into that. All of us who are descendants from Adam, Adam and I say ordinary generation because not Christ He's born of a woman, but he's not in the generation ordinarily, naturally from Adam. They're all subject to these miseries of a fallen life. And so, you know, no one's guaranteed safety or security from hardship and trials and disappointments. No one's guaranteed anything but death. And, and the result of that is um, all of these miseries in life and having to face all these either painful things or unwanted circumstances the result of, of Adam's fall is by nature we're inclined to respond to the unexpected and uncertain, the living sinful fear and anxiety, a worry about what might happen. And so anxiety and worry are the result of fear and the fear of man, the fear of loss, the fear of future. Um, and all those things are not uh, are violations of the first commandment, right? To fear the, the Lord your God, right? So, a fear, love, and trust him above all things. And anxiety and, and worry most commonly occur when we allow our minds to be fixated on all possible disastrous outcomes. The psychological term for that is catastrophizing, right? Which sounds like a goofy made up word. And it is in fact thinking that everything is going to result in the worst case scenario and then acting upon those things even before they have ever happened. So the, the root of fear, the fear that you and I have, is really self-love and pride, right? It, it leads us to pursue this kind of self-protection and security. And self-protection results in fear and anxiety when, when we conclude that we lack more than we want, or we consider all the possible outcomes of an uncertain circumstances of life. I want something more. I'm going to protect myself to get it. Um, or I don't, I'm worried about what the 
the outcome of these things will be, so I'm going to protect myself. Um, and again, the, the Lord has called his Christians to not to protect themselves, but to give themselves over to their neighbor, and uh, because that is the shared life they have in Christ Jesus. He did all that. Jesus, as he does a great many things good, he does all things well. He summarized the problem when he teaches his disciples not to worry. He says in Matthew 6, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you put uh, will put on. Is your life more than food and your body more than clothing? Do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. In other words, the pagans, the pagans, those who don't have God, um, do those things because they think that they can control them, and they don't have a heavenly Father, one who is perfectly um, found in God the Father to care and do all those things good for you. Um, even if, and sometimes this is the problem too, even if your experiences in this life would say otherwise. Um, even if your emotions in this life would say otherwise. So all of that is to be said. This is what causes, you know, uh, fear and anxiety. But living in a final world is not an excuse. And, and I think sometimes when we talk about sins, we go, well, I'm a sinner. I mean, we, this was, it came out in the sermon on Sunday, like, uh, it's almost like an excuse to do these things as if they don't matter. And they do. And Paul makes it, and this is a long quote from scripture from Romans chapter six, he makes this abundantly clear. Uh, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? You do not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Something's different. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Your life shared in him is now different. It's new. It's a resurrected life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall surely be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. You're now free not to do those wicked things. You're now free not to worry and to fear and to have anxiety. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. So God appointed remedies for sinful anxiety and worry, ultimately fear is what he's talking about. And Paul does that in the, in the Philippians verse that we had at the very beginning here. He says, don't be anxious about anything. And you think, okay, perfect. I won't be anxious. That I, the problem is maybe when we, we hear that or we view that, we, it's like an impossibility. Well, I have to be anxious. And the thing is, don't be anxious about anything is not some kind of naked prohibition. It's not some just direct command. Um, not a just don't do it because the alternative is in fact provided. So it's not just don't be anxious, but also, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So knowing this, right, trusting in this, not just having a head knowledge of it, just say, well, I know I'm not supposed to be anxious, but actually believing that these things are true, 
you find it true, um, finding it true in our experiences can be difficult, right? They're really two different things. Um, but in, in Philippians 4, Paul is insisting that we must be, it, it's got to be our constant practice. Training is probably a good way to say that too. So uh, don't be anxious, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, um, present your request to God is not something that you uh, just in and of yourself can automatically do, but you must be trained to do it. And you must train yourselves to do it. And so, um, you know, something to point out is that don't be anxious is not like a head in the sand kind of thing. It's not pretending. We're not talking, you know, Christians are not ostriches with their heads in the sand. Uh, and it doesn't mean everything is going to be great. Um, that Paul admits that there are going to be things. And, you know, in fact, when does Paul write Philippians? He writes it while he's in jail. And then what's the outcome at the end of his jail sentence in Philippians? He gets executed. <laughs> so, um, and if he writes those things, I mean, uh, it's certainly to say, and he suffers with a great many things, for one, a thorn in the flesh that we don't even know what it is, but the Lord won't even take it away from him. And I would certainly not consider myself better than Paul. Uh, you know, these pressures that we have, the goal then is to find our rest in God and not in ourselves. So Paul doesn't deny the existence of anxieties. Instead, he tells us what to do with them. Uh, not not above, not about personality. It's not about like being, that was a cricket in here. Not about a personality. So it's not about like being more optimistic or pessimistic, but it is about living above that tension, living above those anxieties, even as they occur, and even as those fears occur, or even as suffering occurs. So you think, where, where is strength and mercy found in times of need? It isn't found in knowing the living God. And again, not just head knowledge. We'll see. Knowing the living God is not just reading a book um, or knowing even the fact that God has said these things. It is, in fact, living in those words. And so God calls Christians, you and I, to go on the offensive about these to be ready, and, and Peter does a good job of saying this when he talks about this in, in the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. He talks about suffering. 1 Peter is all about suffering. We talk about that on Sunday now. He says, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, let your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you in the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the Greek words there, uh, and there's a lot of them, but certainly when he says Dio, therefore, connecting to all these previous things he's talking about, suffering that people are going through, all these things that produce fear and worry and anxiety, the literal words that he uses is he says, having girded up the loins of your mind, right, or the mind of, your, of you in a very wooden sense. So he's saying, gird up the loins of your mind. And you think about, that's Old Testament language, right? Gird up your loins. We don't really do that now. But you think about people in the ancient world, and even at the time when Peter writes, they wore robes when they walked around. Um, and uh, those robes, if they ran or they served, or even they, when they were walking to do something, they could get in the way, causing them to trip and fall. So a person had to gird it up. There's a picture there of what that looks like. <laughs> uh, they had to lift up their robes so they could walk freely. Maybe the closest thing we get to that now is if, if a woman is wearing a dress. I guess now a man or two. But anyway, if a woman is wearing a dress and she's walking up the stairs, she lifts it up so she doesn't fall over. And so the, the purpose of these things, is if you're girding up your mind, the loins of your mind, you're preparing yourself for action. It means you're preparing yourself not only to fight, but for hard labor. Difficult things that you're going to have to do in order to overcome these things. 
the tools that you're going to have to actually use that God has given you. And the, and the Lord God says this to Job, and you think, this is at the end of ending part of Job, after all these sufferings, and the Lord gives these wonderful sermons to Job. But he says, dress for action like a man. And again, a man goes into battle in the ancient world by girding up his loins and preparing, just like the dude is doing in that picture there. He's uh, uh, he's pulled them up so that he can run forward and that he can actually not fall on his face as he's facing something that is trying to kill him. In the Greek of the Old Testament, in the Septuagint, the, the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Greek words there are gird up your loins. It's the same sense. He says that he continues, I will question you and, and make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? In other words, prepare yourself for action, even in these distress, and to question me, do you even know who I am? Because I know you, this is telling Job, do you think I do wrong to you? Do you even have the arm, the strength, the power that the Lord God has made? He even continues to go on when he talks to Job to say, um, were you there when I created the foundations of the world? And so as if God would not do things that are good for him, even in the face of things that appear to be bad. So what are those actions? Think about going back to what Paul says in Philippians, what are those actions? They're prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, letting your requests be made known to God. So all of that is making your requests be made uh, known to God, um, made known. There should be an N at the end of that one. But it's prayer and thanksgiving, right? And you think of prayer, the word prayer, um, pros, uh, yo, uh, K is is uh is one of those words that can mean exchanging with God in something. Wishes could be one thing. You're exchanging the things that you desire with God. But it also means, um, in the New Testament, a place of prayer, too. I mean, that word doesn't just mean praying, but it means a place of prayer. So saying to God what you desire to say, saying it in a place where you know, and that's the thing when you talk about if we want to get a little bit practical, how am I praying to God? I, I often hear people say, well, I'll go, I pray to him all the time. I'm driving, I'm doing this, and I, I'm, there's nothing wrong with that. But you think in, in moments of great distress or in fear or in anxiety, why would you not go to the place, the house of prayer that the Lord has called? where he's actually physically present with you, where you have in the assurance that there is no doubt in your mind that he hears you because you know he's there. He comes to you every Sunday. So, um, and this is what Jesus says, right? He uses the same word when he says in, in Matthew 21, my house is a house of prayer. I mean, it means the church. Uh, and this is actually what happens in the Old Testament, if you notice that. I mean, there are moments in which people pray and they um, prostrate themselves. They bow themselves to their face to pray to God, and it can happen outside of that. But often when they go and they want to pray to God, where will they go? They will go to things, places where they have established where he has been to them, where he has visited them and done things for them. Um, and so we, we make use of those things. Um, which is why, I mean, the church is open and unlocked. It or should be. Or you have a key if it's in the middle of the night. Or you call your pastor in the middle of the night and tell him to go up to the church. I need to pray. Why not? So praying the words that he's given you is important because he knows you. Right, The son knows you. He shares a life with you. His life is now your life. And the Father now knows you because the Son knows you. And so, you know, it's important to think about prayer, and this will bleed into some prayer things and some practical stuff. 
I'm, I'm in fear, I'm in anxiety, I'm in worry about something, I'm going to pray the words that God has given me because he knows me better than I know myself. He knows all things about me. And um, in fact, he knows me so well that, and we'll see from John 10, that he lays down his life for me. Why would I not do that? So Jeremiah 29, everyone knows this. You put it on a t-shirt, I think, or it's your favorite confirmation verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And yeah, he knows all these things for you. He does things well for you. So why would you not pray the words that he has given you? The same thing, I'm the good shepherd, Jesus says, I know my own and my own know me, just as my father knows me, I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Or in another passage, the sheep know my voice. Where is the voice? It's in scripture. And I say that because sometimes when you think prayer, prayer is like, I don't know the right words to say. I don't know what to say. Well, he's given you those words. You don't have to make up things um, in order to, to pray to God uh, because sometimes you can't express. I mean, most people can't express how they feel in words in a normal basis. So God has given you all those things, his own words. So you think on the top of page five, if he knows you fully, right? And Hebrews 4 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. He's fully us in everything apart from sin. And if every word of Scripture, he's in every word, he is every word. He says this in John chapter 5, You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they that bear witness about me. You could even think about the road to Emmaus when he walks and he says they're trying to understand these things and he opens their minds to the scriptures and reveals that he's on you know, everything that is about him in there. Then why not pray his words? If they are Christ's words and you share a life with him, then they are in fact your words. In fact, he's changed your words to reflect that. And you find this most prominently in, in the Psalms. So um, where is fear expressed by God's people and anxiety and an anxious heart and teaching how to take those fears and cast them onto the Lord in prayer? Well, there and there's a few Psalms there that lay those things out, but they're in the Psalms. And maybe we lose that. I, I don't know. I think we have. If you look at the ancient church, um, what was the practice of the ancient church? It was often to build, I mean, church fathers, most of them had books of psalms that were put together based on things that were going on in your life. I mean, we do that with Bible verses, but um, you think about when they, uh, in the ancient church, what they would do is they would memorize psalms. They would take them to heart. So those words then just transformed to become their own. Most of the hymns are made from psalms. A lot of the hymns are made from psalms, yeah, I got it. absolutely. And psalms express emotion. And in fact, if they are the Lord's words, then they are redeemed emotion. So I'm angry, what do I do? I read with the psalmist to call out, God, why have you done this? Why have you forsaken me? I'm a, I'm worried. Lord, do not, and we'll see this in Psalm 119. I put an example for it. But in Proverbs 12, when you think of wisdom for you and for me as Christians, um, it says, anxiety in a man's heart uh, weighs him down, but a, a good word makes him glad. A good word. What is good, and there is no one good but God, and so his word is good too. It's not a Everything's going to be all right. It's a, it's a, like the words that are in Psalm 119, and I'll read them for us. And you can see the emotion in them. My soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. I hold, when I, I told, when I, when I told of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Give me, make me understand the way of your precepts. 
and I will meditate on your wondrous works. My soul melts away from sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Put false ways far from me and graciously teach me your law. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. Set your rules before me. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. And a fraction of what, I mean, the rest of Psalm 19 is the same thing. A fraction of what um, sorrow and grief and worry coupled with corresponding like a conversation. I mean, it is in fact a conversation in the Psalms between you and God. And he's already given you the words to know what those are. You, you cry out, my soul clings to the dust. I fear my life. I fear what is to come. And then give me life according to your word. And then he answers, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. My soul melts away from sorrow. He answers, strengthen me according to your word. And he does. So, the next part, when you talk about prayer, what Paul is getting at is supplication with thanksgiving. And uh, there's a key word that stands out in the Greek when you think about thanksgiving. It is eucharista or eucharistas. And so it not only do we present our prayers and our petitions to God, but we are also, we do so with thanksgiving. In fact, in Scripture, in the New Testament, it's called a sacrifice of praise from Hebrews 13. It's called a Eucharistic sacrifice. Um, and so anyone can offer praise when things are going well. Things are great. Thanks, thanks God. That's often what we do. Um, but to give thanks to God when things are wrong. In, in fact, this is actually the opposite of what you're inclined to do in your natural person. I'm inclined when I face worry and fear and anxiety to collapse upon myself, almost like into a fetal position. I've been punched in the gut, and I'm going to curl up in order to protect myself. And, and the Lord actually inclines you to do the opposite, to sacrifice in thanksgiving. And we'll talk about the word sacrifice here. But, you know, if you want to pull a meaning out of that, it's to praise when by common human reckoning, everything is in the pits. It demands, you know, this is what demands the sacrifice of praise. A Eucharistic sacrifice, if you want to take a definition of it, it's gratitude. We'll hear it this Sunday in the, the, the reading about, in the gospel reading about the 10 lepers. But it's a grateful language to God. But it is, in fact, an act of worship. And, and an act of worship in Scripture is not all in your brain. It's not even lifting up your hands to music that makes me feel good. Worship is a physical act. That's what happens in Scripture. Think about what Paul says in Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Or we sing this in the Venite in Matins, Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. So, uh, to praise, to give worship, is to be grateful is an action. It is to present your bodies as a living sacrifice in thanksgiving to God. So, I'm worried, I'm upset. What I tend to do, well, I'll sit and I'll sulk or I'll close myself off, or I'll curl myself into a little fetal position because I worry that everything is rolling out of control. I, I have anxiety about what I'm doing. I fear all these things, people more than God. And what Paul tells you to do is to praise in a sacrifice of thanksgiving. So it means to worship, and I would say in the divine worship, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the Lord's Supper, because there's a connection in the word Eucharist. But it also means to offer your body as a living sacrifice. I'm going to give myself, and this changes the reality of what I'm looking at. 
I'm going to give myself in, in holy and acceptable worship to God. I'm going to go out and do things, good, godly things in response to that. We talked about that a little bit on Sunday, but you know, the reality is when people are depressed too, and fear and anxiety and depression, they all kind of go sort of hand in hand because they all are about self. They're about me. I fear something because of me. I'm anxious about something because I, I of me. I fear people will look at me. I fear I won't get the result that um, that I think will come. I fear repercussions for things, and and uh, the point of living sacrifice and 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 offering your body in that is to focus less on you and more on loving your neighbor in giving your life to something else, to someone else, most notably to the Lord. <laughs> so you think this is actually what God does. You think Eucharist, Eucharista, Thanksgiving is, a, is the church's name for the Lord's Supper. We don't often use it here, but I mean, uh, we could say Holy Communion, Eucharist, all those things. It's the physical act, you think physical worship in receiving the true body and blood of Christ, right? So in it, he gives rest from futile effort and trying to control as a result of worry and fear. He removes sin, the thing that is causing your fear. Um, and in the Lord's blood, he gives you a drink to receive faith and cleansing you from all those sins. He takes care of the thing in receiving from him a physical uh a physical means of worship in the Lord's Supper. So you think it's the realization that the living Christ here and now in, in flesh does this. It's true repentance. I mean, th with any sin, you think, how do I overcome fear and anxiety? If it's a sin that I'm doing it, then I do it with repentance. What is repentance? Well, law and gospel. I confess my sin that I am in fear and I receive from God the forgiveness that he desires to give to me. Where does he give that forgiveness? Well, he's given to me in baptism. He's given it to me in the Lord's Supper. It's a physical thing that I can take. It's not just in my brain where I've, I've caused all these sins to begin with. Or I confess it and someone pronounces and speaks those words of forgiveness into my life. We get that in hymns. We talk about hymns and psalms and whatnot. But in... Uh, in our hymnal from 602, the gifts Christ freely gives, we, we've sung this before, the gifts are in the feast, the gifts are far more than we see, beneath the bread and wine is food from Calvary. The body, the blood, remove our every sin, we leave his presence in his peace and renewed again. So we leave in thanksgiving for what he's done for me, and offer our bodies as a living sacrifice because he offers himself to us first as that sacrifice. So the result of all that, and we'll talk about more like really practical things to do, because um, I've got a whole list of them. And I think we want to take the things that we've learned theoretically and in scripture, we want to apply them into real life. Now we'll talk about that the next time. But the results of this is the next verse that Paul identifies is, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, or surpasses all understanding. So don't be anxious about anything. In prayer and supplication, make your uh, requests be made known to God, and he will spawn, he will respond to you in peace, a peace that you can't get in the world because he gives you uh, things that are above the world. Uh, these are heavenly treasures and um, not earthly ones. Amen. All right. Amen. Questions, comments. Not a lot of questions, so we don't we we move through it pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we'll we'll close a little early and we'll pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us your Son, Jesus Christ, that in him we are known to the Father. We are known by God because of the Christ who comes who knows us fully, all things. 
that he is not foreign to anything, fear or anxiety, or he's not foreign to the worry that we have in this life. Lord, help us always to pray to you with the words that you have given us, that we may call out to you because you desire to hear us and you answer us. Let us offer thanksgiving and sacrifice with our lives to you, and trusting that you are doing all things for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. That was a good word. Yeah, very good. Yes, thank you.